with me in the New Testament to John chapter 18 this morning. John chapter 18, we're going to be reading and examining the first 12 verses of that chapter today. We are coming into the final section of the Gospel of John, the Passion of Christ, the word passion there being a technical term to describe the suffering of Jesus. And ordinarily, this would serve as kind of an inclusive category of his suffering, his betrayal, his trials, his torture, ultimately his crucifixion, his death, burial, and even the resurrection accounts that we find in the latter chapters of all four Gospels. Before we read God's Word this morning, let's bow together and ask God to bless our time in the Scriptures. Our great God and Father, we pray that your Spirit would come anew to impress upon our hearts and minds that the Bible is your Word written. That it is not merely, O Lord, a historical account written by uninspired men. That it is not merely a theological treatise written about you by uninspired and fallible men. But rather that it is your own Word, your own record, O God, of all that occurred in the work and life of your Son the work that He performed so that we might be saved. We pray, O God, that You would bless us and give us hearts to hear and to believe all that the Scriptures say and that You would strengthen us by means of the precious gospel that we meet here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now God's Word, John chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. This is the holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of our God. When Jesus had spoken these words, He went out with His disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which He and His disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed Him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with His disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon Him, went forward and said to them, "'Whom are you seeking?' They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Thus far the word of our God that word that is true and holy and written and preserved for our edification and instruction. Well, as we come into this final section of John's Gospel, we need to be mindful of the importance of this part of the story. All four of the Gospel writers, in fact, devote a considerable percentage of their histories of the life and ministry of Christ to this period of betrayal, arrest, trial, crucifixion, and then ultimately resurrection. And the percentages of the four Gospels that are devoted to this section uh, indicate to us something of the significance of this period. You think about how little we know of Jesus' life prior to the beginning of His public ministry. How comparatively little we know even during his public ministry. We have four accounts, yes, and we have many different stories. But if this period extended over three or three and a half years, perhaps, as the gospel seemed to indicate, surely there were many other things that occurred that are not written down. And John will even say as much at the end of his gospel. Why is it that we spend so little time on the early life of Christ, so comparatively little time on many of the interactions that no doubt that Christ surely must have had, and yet can spend a a considerable amount of time on His suffering and death and resurrection? Well, simply stated, it is that if Christ does not suffer and die and rise, then our faith is for nothing. Christianity without the cross is simply moralism. It would be a religion like Buddhism, except without any hope of enlightenment. 
Or it would be an ethical system like Stoicism, yet including religious ritual. Without the cross, there is no atonement. Without the resurrection, there is no good news. Without the passion of the Christ, there is no Christianity. There is only the record of the moral teachings of a renegade rabbi. Matthew Henry gives us, I think, a very helpful entry point in his commentary on this text. He says, quote, The hour was now come that the captain of our salvation, who was to be made perfect by sufferings, should engage the enemy. We have here his entrance upon the encounter. The day of recompense is in his heart, and the year of his redeemed is come, and his own arm works the salvation. Our Lord Jesus, like a bold champion, takes the field first. End quote. Surely you've noticed in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, how David enters the battlefield to meet Goliath, the Philistine giant. Have you noticed this? He does not walk, he runs. He runs onto the battlefield. We might have advised him, David, save your energy. You're going to want to run once you're out there, not run to be there. But no, he runs. He's eager to meet the enemy of the people of God. And he is confident that Yahweh will fight on his behalf. And in a similar way, the son of David, though not running literally, nonetheless runs metaphorically, he comes forward, he meets his foes, and the battle is engaged. John recounts the betrayal and arrest of Jesus in a way that emphasizes his complete control of this event, even more clearly than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, do. Now, this doesn't mean that there is any conflict in these histories. The information in all four gospels can be easily reconciled by those who accept them as God-breathed Scripture. But whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe Jesus' agony in Gethsemane prior to Judas' arrival, you'll notice here in John 18 that John passes over that part of the story completely. And I would suggest that that is perhaps because he is aware of the other accounts. He wants to focus his readers on other themes that need to be emphasized here. And the Spirit uses each of the Gospel writers to draw out particular points for emphasis while faithfully preserving the same history of Jesus' life. Now in John 18, especially these first 12 verses, the emphasis clearly lies on Jesus' perfect control of these events. His betrayal by Judas, his arrest then by Jewish and Roman authorities. The Lord is not hiding in the garden when they find Him. He goes to a place that He knew Judas knew about. He goes somewhere that He knew He would be found. He's not arrested like an ordinary criminal. Instead, He actually initiates contact with the authorities. He identifies Himself. He negates efforts by one of the disciples that would have enabled Him to escape. And then He surrenders Himself to them. And by doing all of this, Jesus fulfilled what He had already said Back in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, quote, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. That's what we're seeing here in John 18. A Lord who is completely in control. A Lord who is lording it over those who would presume to exercise authority over Him. I want to look at this passage under three headings. And I want you to notice in these first 12 verses of John 18, the picture, the type that we have of the larger gospel message. First, in verses 1-6, through six, we have Jesus' proactive sacrifice of Himself. The confrontation takes place in a garden that we said was well known to Jesus' disciples because He often used it when He was in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And I think that when I was growing up and I heard this story and, and read these accounts, I always imagined this garden as kind of like a public park where Jesus was uh, residing at that moment. But it was almost certainly a private piece of land which the owner would have allowed Jesus to use. But I want you to notice the significance of John's comment. He says, Judas who betrayed him also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Jesus is not attempting to evade his betrayer. He was seeking to be found. He doesn't walk right into the temple to incite the authorities, but he places himself in just the spot where he knew they would easily be able to capture him. 
Judas had been given soldiers by the chief priests, it says, to accompany his traitorous errand. And the Greek word here makes it clear that these were not Jewish guards from the temple, although those were probably present as well, we see in verse 12. But these were Roman soldiers that were members of a larger detachment. And so we have Judas with Roman soldiers, as well as officers from the Jews, all coming into the garden. And notice the, the way in which John draws out this scene. I want you to try and picture this in your mind. This fairly large group of officials and soldiers comes with lanterns and torches and weapons to arrest Jesus. Do you have that picture in your mind? Do you see the absurdity of it yet? We we'll continue reading, verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? He went out to meet them. I mean, you, you, see this, you see this group with lanterns and torches and weapons, and, and some of them are clearly professional Roman soldiers, and Jesus goes out to meet them? Doesn't he know that they're there to arrest him? Yes, of course, the, the text says. He knew all things that would come upon him. And knowing that, he went out so that the final stage of the Father's plan might begin. He knows that the time has come. And so Jesus approaches this large group of men and challenges them with a question. He says, whom are you seeking? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus replies, I am, or I am he. And we'll say more about that in a minute. And when he answers them, when he identifies himself to them, the soldiers fell to the ground. Now are you beginning to see the absurdity in this? Right? You, you, have, you have this contingent of, of the army coming to get Jesus and who is in control. Jesus has them completely outnumbered. Who is arresting whom? Who is actually in charge in this moment? Now, how are we to understand what happens with the soldiers here? Why do they collapse? Some commentators suggest that Jesus strikes them with his divine power, you know, invisibly. Just the force of his presence knocks them down. I do like that interpretation, by the way. I'm not sure at all that that's right. But he certainly could have, and, and, it, and it's a terrific explanation. Another possibility is that, is that you have this man stepping out of the dark, right, so boldly confronting them, identifying himself projecting who he is in such a way that, that the soldiers in front step back and trip over the ones behind them, and several of them are ending up on the ground. But however it happened, the point is clear. Jesus is proactive in this situation. He takes the initiative. He is voluntarily surrendering himself as a sacrifice. He is not a criminal. He is not a helpless martyr. He is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the world's sin. He is the Lord of life who surrenders Himself in order to give life to God's sons. Now, Calvin in his commentary describes Jesus' self-identification here as mild. I'm not sure if he's correct about that, but nonetheless, he's certainly correct in saying this, quote, There was no want of power in Him to restrain their hands if He had thought proper, but He wished to obey His Father by whose decree He knew that He was called to die. Jesus, if he's, if he's in control like this, you, you think he couldn't have gotten away? You think he couldn't have been some other place? You think he couldn't have put all of those soldiers on the ground and then done as he pleased and then walked on when he was ready? He is giving himself. He is not being taken anywhere he doesn't want to go. Calvin goes on and makes a very sobering observation here that I want you to consider. Quote, we may infer from this how dreadful and alarming to the wicked the voice of Christ will be when He shall ascend His throne to judge the world. At that time, He stood as a lamb ready to be sacrificed. His majesty, so far as outward appearance was concerned, was utterly gone. And yet when He utters but a single word, His armed and courageous enemies fall down. And what was the word? He thunders no fearful excommunication against them, but only replies, It is I. What then will be the result when He shall come, not to be judged by a man, but to be the judge of the living and the dead? Not in that mean and despicable appearance, but shining in heavenly glory and accompanied by His angels." End quote. Have you thought about that? 
I mean, if this is the way that wicked men on a wicked errand respond to Jesus in the state of humiliation at the time when His glory is most dimly perceived, what will it be like when the trumpet shall sound and Christ will appear in the heavens in flaming fire in order to take vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel? Christ was not crucified because He was unable to prevent it. As he said to Peter at this same time, but recorded in Matthew's Gospel, Do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and He will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? You know, one day He will come with those legions. He will come with the angels in order to execute justice and judgment on the world. There will be a loud trumpet blast. And there will be a heavenly army of angels coming in flaming fire. And every one of us will see that one day. What will that be like? If the soldiers in the garden fell at the feet of Jesus at this time, what will men do when He appears at that time? In verses 7 to 9, we have Jesus' vicarious substitution. And vicarious in this context is referring to something He's doing on behalf of another. He gives Himself in our place. That is the teaching of Scripture. That is the message of the Gospel. But it is historically acted out in the garden that night when Jesus was betrayed. So you have the scene, the soldiers are on the ground, perhaps some of them are kind of rising to their feet, struggling to get up, and Jesus asks them again, whom are you seeking? He has them under pressure. He's aggressive in this confrontation. He's controlling the space and taking away their advantage. And when they again identify Jesus as their target, He says, I told you that I am. And then He begins to use the advantage that He had gained. I told you that I am, therefore if you're looking for me, let these go. Let these disciples go their way. That is a picture of what happens on the cross. The law demanded death for transgressors. The devil decried the righteous status that God gave to sinful saints. Holy justice demanded a penalty, and on Calvary Jesus said, take me and let these go their way. Every one of those disciples could have been arrested that night and brought up on trumped-up charges just as Jesus was. They could have been condemned as collaborators and traitors, but Jesus acted decisively to save their lives. And in case you're wondering about the propriety of this analogy, I want you to notice the connection that John makes. Verse 9, he said this, "...in order that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me I have lost none." Now you say, but wait a second, John. When Jesus said, of those whom you gave me, I've lost none. This is from the high priestly prayer in John 17. When Jesus said that, he was talking about their salvation. He's not talking about their physical safety at this moment in the garden. But do you see the point that John is making? He's saying this is a picture of that. This is a type. This is a shadow. This is an analogy. What Jesus is doing in securing the physical safety of His disciples in the garden at this time is an analog of what He is doing for all of those that the Father has given to Him in all of time. He is taking their place. The Bible does an amazing thing when it makes this statement in verse 9 that we just read. It identifies an oral saying of Christ by the same formula that is used for Scripture. Did you notice that? That the saying might be fulfilled and then the Scriptures quote Jesus. You see that formula many times in your Bible. That the Scripture might be fulfilled. That the words of Isaiah might be fulfilled. That the words of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. But twice here in chapter 18 we will see it used with reference to the words of Christ. And at one level, that shouldn't surprise us in any way because, of course, the words of Jesus are faithful and true and are equal to Scripture in authority and weight. But it underlines an important point that you do not need to miss. And that is when a word comes out of Jesus' mouth, it is the Word of God. It is the Word of God, whether it's been written down or not. It was as certain and as true as any word from long ago. John's writing this down many years after this event, but what Jesus said was God's Word. And it didn't wait later recording and then collating and then reproducing and then being recognized as canon. 
It was God's word by virtue of the fact that the word of God spoke it. And the reason this is important is that some of you, and especially you young people, in college, you will hear that Christ sometimes spoke in error. Or sometimes Jesus, being a man, being a man, had the limitations of his humanity, and so sometimes he made errant statements. And the proper biblical response to that is nonsense. The words of Jesus would be fulfilled just like the words of the prophets because Christ's word is God's own word. Now twice in this text, Jesus identifies himself to the arresting authorities, and then John quotes it a third time, verse 6, emphasizing the form of his expression. And we need to draw your attention to this for just a moment. The New King James and the ESV both render this self-identification with the words, I am he. But if you're using the New King James, you'll probably notice that the word he is italicized, which indicates that it was a word that was supplied by the translators to smooth out the reading. Or if you're reading the ESV, which doesn't use that particular uh, form in its translation, nonetheless, you'll see a footnote indicating that in Greek it is simply the statement, eroimi, I am. And this is the way in which the Greek Old Testament rendered Yahweh's self-identification at the burning bush. It is the same way that Jesus identifies himself multiple times in the Gospels, most clearly in John 8, 58, when he says, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now what's happening here is in John 18, the translators of these versions are assuming that this is simply Jesus' way of answering his persecutors and identifying himself. But I want to suggest to you that John's quotation of it, there's no reason for John to quote it here, except to draw attention to the form of expression. I mean, he quotes it immediately after Jesus says it, and right before he says it again. But he's drawing attention to the form of expression, and it is repeated three times in the text, all of these suggesting that it is not inappropriate for us to see an allusion to the divine name here. Now, I'm not suggesting that the authorities that night recognized it as such, that when Jesus says, me," that they immediately say, oh, he's claiming to be Yahweh. That's That's not what I'm imagining. But how is the believing church to hear this? When we hear Jesus in the garden saying, I am, when John says, he replied, I am, and then again Jesus says, I am, how is the believing church supposed to hear that? We're supposed to hear the name of God. We're supposed to hear the voice of our God. Christ is the good shepherd He protected his sheep in the garden, and he will protect his sheep throughout the present age in order to bring us safely to the Father. Our shorter catechism says it this way in question 26, Christ executeth the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. And Calvin reassures us of this in his commentary. He says, quote, Whenever, therefore, either wicked men or devils make an attack upon us, let us not doubt that this good shepherd is ready to aid us in the same manner. Do you see Jesus in his vicarious substitution, his sacrifice, taking the place of those disciples, standing between the danger and his beloved ones? Take me, let these go their way. I am the one who has come to save them. The soldiers were looking for Jesus in order to arrest Him. The Jewish leaders sought Him as a rival and enemy in order to neutralize Him. Judas sought Him as an opportunity to obtain pay. But in the garden that night, Jesus was seeking too. He was engaged in doing the Father's will. He was ready to lay down His life for God's chosen. And as Augustine described it, And this should be put on a t-shirt or a coffee mug because this is just absolutely amazing. He said, quote, They verily in their mad rage sought for him to put him to death, but he too in giving himself to death was seeking for us. One of them found what they were seeking. And then in verses 10 to 12, you see the spiritual salvation. The spiritual salvation that Christ is there to work on our behalf. Now all four Gospels tell us what happened next, but only John identifies the disciple that would be Jesus' Savior. Peter draws his sword 
and he swings at one of the men who has come to take his Lord. Now, either Peter was an incredible swordsman to be able to remove the ear without causing any uh, mortal harm, or Malchus was a very fortunate man that night. The blow cut off his right ear. I assume Peter was swinging at his head, and I do not think we should assume that Peter believed that he could win that battle. I don't think he believed that he could defeat all of the soldiers. He was a very confident person we see in the Gospels, but he was not a fool. Earlier that evening in the upper room, Peter had affirmed his willingness to die for the Lord. And I think you see here in the garden his sincerity. He meant it. The disciples have only two swords among all of them that night, and there is a group of professional Roman soldiers. Peter, in my mind believes that he is going to give Jesus enough time to run away into the dark. He's going to give Jesus enough time to escape. He might go down in a blaze of glory, but he would take enough of them with him so that Jesus would survive. But rather than running away into the darkness, Jesus rebukes his loyal protector. He says, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Now, references to the cup appear several times in the Old Testament prophetic literature. In the majority of those instances, the cup refers to God's judgment, which would be consumed by the objects of His wrath. This is the same cup that Jesus prayed would pass from Him in the Gethsemane ordeal that is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was the cup of judgment that was owed to us, the cup of judgment that we were to receive and drink because of our sins. And how has that cup now passed from us to Christ? It is given to Him, He says, by the Father. It is from the Father's hand that Jesus has received this. It is the Father's will that Christ died for our sins on the cross. The crucifixion was not a ransom paid to the devil or owed to God due to an external obligation. It was God's own remedy for the dilemma of love and justice. It was the Father's plan for His Son to suffer for us And so Christ was willing to drink our judgment. Therefore, the Roman soldiers and the commander and the servants of the Jews seized Jesus and bound Him. And what you see here is that there are Roman soldiers and a band of Jews coming together to put hands on one sacrifice. One sacrifice. The Lamb of God who is to take away the sins of the world. And you may recall in Leviticus, in the orders for Levitical sacrifice, the offerer had to place his hands upon the head of the lamb to be identified with him in order for that lamb's blood to atone for his soul. What we should see here is that both Jews and Gentiles are complicit in the greatest crime in the history of humanity, and both Jews and Gentiles are redeemed and reconciled by the very same sacrifice. The Jews don't lay hold of the law in order to be saved. The Greeks don't lay hold of philosophy in order to be saved. Both the Jews and the Gentiles have to lay hold of Christ. He is the only sacrifice that can save. The Lord did not allow Peter to save his life because only by sacrificing himself could Jesus save our souls. He did not come to secure his physical salvation, but rather to provide us a spiritual one. He came to rescue us from sin and death and the judgment to come. But in order to do that, Jesus had to pass through the valley of the shadow of death and drink the cup of judgment from the hand of His Father. And so when the hour of judgment came, He did not draw back. He did not evade. He did not postpone. He stepped forward. He laid down His life. And on the third day, He took it up again. The betrayal and arrest of Jesus clearly demonstrates central truths about the gospel that it was a proactive and voluntary sacrifice, that it was an act of vicarious substitution, that it was an event ordered to provide a spiritual salvation to all who put their trust in Him. Do you see the love of your Lord in this story? Do you see His readiness to suffer torture and to die for you? Do you see the price that had to be paid for your forgiveness and mine? It is not a small thing that Jesus has done for us. It is a remarkable thing. Amazing love, amazing grace, an amazing Savior. And so let faith in Him and gratitude for Him be our continual and unquenchable response.
to that gift. Let's bow together. Our God and Father in heaven, we cannot thank you adequately. We cannot thank you enough that you handed the cup that was filled with wrath against us, that held our judgment, that you handed that cup to your own Son, that you appointed Him to drink it in our stead, that we, through those Roman soldiers and Jewish officers, we who laid hold of Christ in hatred might now be able to lay hold of Christ in faith. We thank you, O God, for the effectual redemption, for the perfect atonement, for the everlasting reconciliation that you have accomplished by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. And we do pray, O Father, that you would work within us the grace of faith, the grace of repentance, the grace of thankfulness, that we might live before you with reverence, that we might rejoice in you forever. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's take our hymnal now and turn together to number 264. Number 264, and if you're able, please.